All right, well, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak here. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure and it's also good to be back uh, in a conference for the first time after the uh, pandemic. Um, so, since uh, uh, I know that people here have uh, very broad interests, um, um, I, I, I thought of uh, giving you some sort of overview of, of some of the problems we've been uh, uh, looking uh, at. Um, and uh, um, this will also allow me that uh, every time I get to something very technical, I'll just skip it. Um, so, <clears throat> this, this will be uh, uh, primarily joint work with, uh, with uh, Mihail Efrim, and it's about global solutions for one-dimensional dispersive models. And so, since this is a, a conference that's oriented toward fluids, um, what I have on my first slide is first a typical problem, a dispersive problem in one dimension. Um, and you see uh, the linear part of the equation on the left. For now, we'll put some nonlinearity on the right, some Cauchy data. Um, and then, uh, um, given such a problem, the symbol of this multiplier here, A of psi, gives us the dispersion relation. For each frequency xi, we have a group velocity, which is A prime of xi. And the fact that the problems we're looking at are dispersive um, manifests in the fact that the second derivative of this symbol A is non-zero. So this tells us that waves with different frequencies will move with different velocities, and thus uh, they'll have lots of opportunities to interact. Um, and uh, down here I wrote a bunch of uh, dispersion relations that are of interest, starting with the classical uh, NLS uh, and KDV, and then a couple of uh, dispersion relations uh, arising in the study of water waves. So, uh, if, you, if you're interested in water waves, this uh, kind of equations will describe many uh, water wave models. Um, so, um, this uh, slide in here tells you a little bit about the linear part of the equation. Uh, now, uh, of course, you can add various kinds of nonlinearities, and here I put several, several ways so you can try to classify these uh, nonlinearities. Uh, you can think of weaker nonlinearities where the problem is semi linear, um, and then uh, maybe you can use fixed point arguments and have Lipschitz dependence of the solutions on the initial data, or you can take stronger uh, nonlinearities and then you get quasi linear problems like all the water wave equations where you only expect to have continuous dependence on the data. Another important distinction in this lecture will be uh, between uh, nonlinearities which are quadratic, where you can have uh, maybe three varieties uh, of bilinear forms that you might want to uh, look at, uh, and uh, then cubic nonlinearities. And most of this talk will actually be focused on problems with cubic nonlinearities. And finally, a uh, higher order that I will not pay uh, very much uh, attention to. And finally, within the realm of cubic nonlinearities, like here, uh, you can further classify your nonlinearities into focusing and defocusing. Those of you who are familiar with the classical notions of focusing and defocusing, so this is a slight generalization of that, which you can describe, and you, I'll describe it in a moment, depending on uh, the symbol of this uh, uh, trilinear form that you see in here. So here you have bilinear forms and trilinear forms, uh, which we'll use to describe nonlinearities. And if you, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words now about the behavior of the linear flow. Uh, we're looking at global solutions, and in terms of global solutions, what we'd like to do is to uh, draw a parallel between the properties of linear flow and the nonlinear flow. Um, and the first thing that you can do using stationary phase is you can compute some asymptotics for the fundamental solution of your uh, equation. So you have some sort of amplitude, and you see this one over square root of t decay factor, which is typical for dispersive equations in one space dimension. And then you see a phase, and this phase is supposed to have to solve uh, an iconal equation, as usual. Um, and if you try to figure out uh, what this phase is like, you realize that this phase has some self-similarity properties. And um, this uh, psi that you see in here has the property that the uh, uh, function psi prime is the inverse of uh, a prime, a being the symbol for your uh, nonlinearity. Um, and this is closely related to the Legendre transform that you learn in uh, nonlinear PDE. So, uh, 
Psi is le the Legendre transform of A, and A is the Legendre transform of, of Psi. And so this is the fundamental solution. Now, if you look at solutions for the linear equation um, with the nice localized initial data, it will look very much like this uh, fundamental solution, with the exception that instead of having this very precise amplitude at the leading order in here, uh, you're going to have some uh, uh, amplitude, uh, I called it gamma in here, which depends at the leading order on uh, x over t, so it's constant on radiuses uh, starting from the origin, and this, uh, uh, this gamma, which we can think of as some sort of asymptotic profile for our solution, is closely related to the Fourier transform of the initial data. So this is uh, in terms of fundamental solution and behavior of solutions to uh, the linear equation with uh, localized, nice localized initial data. On the other hand, um, going to the dispersive properties of, your, uh, of our linear equation, so we're still with the linear equation, we have dispersive decay bounds, so this is the t to the power minus one half, which comes from the decay of the fundamental solution. By the way, in many of these estimates that I'm writing here, there should be derivatives, right? I have cheerfully omitted all the derivatives uh, for brevity. Uh, and then uh, Strickart's estimates. I wrote here two Strickart's estimates, uh, the L6 estimate and L4, L infinity estimate. Uh, the, you might think in, in linear terms that this is the more fundamental estimate because the L6 estimate follows from L4 and infinity by interpolating with energy, but we'll see in a moment that the L6 uh, is much more convenient to use for the, these problems that uh, I'll be telling you about. Uh, and finally, a third class of estimates, which maybe people haven't been using very much in uh, connection with fluids, is a bilinear L2 estimate, where you take two solutions to the linear equation, but with a very peculiar property that they are separated in frequency. So the support of the initial data for U and the support of the initial data for V are these joint sets. And so the picture that you should be thinking is that the U waves will travel in some direction, the V waves will travel in some other direction, and so we're looking at transversal interaction of waves, um, and then there is some orthogonality which allows you to um, have this kind of bilinear L2 estimates. So the Strickart's estimates are related to the curvature for the dispersion relation, but these bilinear L2 bounds are related to this transversality property for um, linear waves. All right, so all of these things will play a role in our story because we want to look at uh, solutions now to the nonlinear equation which share some or maybe all of these properties over here. All right, and here's the, the main question that we, uh, we have been interested in for a number of years. We take our nonlinear equation, uh, we put some small data to it, and we ask, do we have global solutions? And not only global solutions, global solutions which have some dispersi dis dispersive uh, properties. And of course, this is not always the case. Uh, you are probably well familiar with uh, objects such as uh, solitary waves or solitons. So those are localized solutions for, the, uh, for these equations. Uh, those occur in principle for um, either focusing problems with um, a reasonably large uh, in initial data, or actually problems with large data of all kinds. So that justifies our assumption that we're looking at small initial data in here. And my discussion in a moment will split into two cases. One is the first case where we look at initial data which is both small and localized. So think of your initial data as your favorite bump function, and then you ask what is the global behavior of solutions, a small bump function for the initial data. This is then in many of these problems you are not allowed to have small solitons, so this excludes solitons. Um, now the second scenario, we keep the smallness assumption, but we remove the localization assumption, so now our initial data is in your favorite Sobolev spaces. And we still ask whether you might have global solutions with uh, uh, this kind of initial data. Now you have to worry about solitons, even small solitons. Uh, uh, those would be allowed, for instance, for very simple problems like the cubic 
uh, nonlinear Schrodinger equation in one dimension. And because of this, um, in this uh, second scenario, we're also going to worry about the distinction between focusing and defocusing properties of the equation. All right? So, uh, before I try to tell you a little bit about the results that we have in both of these scenarios, uh, let me uh, begin with a, a quick discussion. Um, whether where you uh, uh, maybe try to distinguish between problems with quadratic nonlinearities and cubic nonlinearities. For quadratic nonlinearities, you have stronger nonlinear interactions and you have to worry about resonance analysis. Resonance analysis plays an important role in here for two wave resonances. Um, and for cubic problems where you have more resonant interactions, but this uh, for small data, the nonlinear interactions are weaker. All right. Uh, and uh, one classical idea in this area is the normal form idea, uh, where in the simplest case, you do a normal form transformation in your equation, uh, which allows you to replace a quadratic nonlinearity with a cubic nonlinearity. So you start with an equation like this, you do a normal form transformation and hopefully you end up with an equation like this. Um, uh, the catch here uh, being the fact that you want this normal form transformation to be bounded. And uh, Shatak in particular worked with some of this uh, normal form transformations uh, for some semi-linear problems, but if you look at quasi-linear problems, which all water wave problems are, then uh, this uh, normal form transformation has a, a big problem, which is that it would be uh, unbounded. And so, in the realm of quasi-linear problems, um, uh, there, there are maybe two interesting ideas of how you can get around this unbounded of the normal form transformation. One, um, which we call the modified energy method, which came up in work with uh, Mihaela and with John Hunter, uh, where we uh, realized that instead of transforming the solutions to the equation, it's better to construct adapted energies, which are cubic energies. Cubic energies means that the energy estimate looks like an energy estimate for a cubic nonlinearity. And another idea uh, in here is the idea of paradiagonalization introduced by Lazard and Delort, which consists in applying a partial normal form transformation. Um, uh, maybe thinking of uh, this setup here, uh, the bounded part of the normal form transformation. Okay, so we're talking about quadratic versus cubic nonlinearities. Uh, I was briefly telling you about some methods to uh, reduce the analysis in problems with quadratic nonlinearities to problems with cubic nonlinearities. Um, I'm not going to emphasize this a lot because from here on, I'm going to switch to discussing only problems with cubic nonlinearities. Um, on tried and true divide and conquer strategy, where you take a harder problem, you eliminate some parts of it, and then you look at the easier problem that's left. So from here on, we're not going to worry very much about problems which are quasi-linear. We're not going to worry very much about normal forms, okay? So instead, we're going to just think of problems which have cubic nonlinearities because these are uh, sufficiently interesting for the things that I want to tell you about. So we have an equation like this. This is a trilinear translation invariant form and also phase rotation invariant. Um, such trilinear forms are described using this uh, symbol, which depends on the three input frequencies, psi1, psi2, and psi3. And one essential assumption that we impose in here is that this nonlinearity is what we call conservative. In other words, the symbol is real on the diagonal. So if you put three equal frequencies in there, you get something real. And this is for a very simple reason, so that the nonlinearity does not instantly force blow up uh, in your equation just by ODE uh, method. So um, uh, this is one assumption. And then the other thing that you want to look at is whether your problem is focusing or defocusing. And this has to do with, again, interactions of three equal frequencies like you see in here. And so the focusing and defocusing character of a problem like this will be given by the sign of the symbol Q evaluated at three equal frequencies. And you compare this with the sign of the second derivative of the dispersion relation. And I don't remember which is what, so I'll skip that. Um, 
So um, on the other hand, uh, going back to my initial comment that we avoid quasi-linear features, if you want to look at the semi-linear versus quasi-linear character of the equation that I wrote in here, this is given by the size of the symbol when the C1, C2, C3 Fourier variables are unbalanced. <clears throat> so you see that you have two very different effects. You have focusing the focusing effects, which correspond to equal frequencies, equal entries, and then um, uh, semi-linear or quasi-linear, which depend on unequal, unbalanced frequencies. So in my talk, the emphasis will be on this action that happens between uh, equal frequencies. All right, so now that I have uh, uh, sort of bracketed the problems that we want to look at, we want to look at cubic problems in one dimension, um, and we'll think of them as uh, semi-linear, and for now, either focusing or defocusing. <clears throat> this is uh, one typical result in the small localized <clears throat> initial data situation. So you take your initial data, you put it in your favorite Sobolev space, you add some localization to it, and one way you can measure localization is by saying that x multiplied by your solution by initial data is in some other Sobolev space. And then what you want to get out of this is um, uh, a global solution, u, which has also global dispersive decay, the t to the power minus one half decay, which was the decay that we saw earlier for the fundamental solution or for solutions to the corresponding uh, linearized equation. And here I want to advertise some uh, recent expository notes that uh, we wrote together with, uh, with Mihaela. And um, in those notes we, we consider two cases. Uh, the simplest case, uh, just for expository purposes, where the symbol Q for the trilinear form has compact support, in which case you put an L2 norm in here and an L2 norm in, in here, and everything is very nice and clean. And then there's also a more messy general case when you take a global bounded uh, uh, cubic form and then uh, a dispersion relation that uh, at infinity behaves like some your favorite power of K. All right, so this captures all those uh, water wave models, for instance, that I was telling you about. So there's a very long list of uh, uh, contributions uh, in here, uh, looking at very specific uh, equations of this form. But what we try to do in this expository notes to, to go beyond this and, and uh, provide a sort of a, a recipe for uh, general problems uh, of this type. And we hope that they are fairly easy to read. And so um, I'll tell you a few words about uh, this result. Uh, um, okay. Um, and so um, let's begin with the linear equation. And we would like to describe uh, linear dispersion using what's called the vector field methods. So you have uh, the L2 norm conserved for this linear equation because the symbol A, we take it to be real. Um, and then to this. Uh, linear operator that you see in here, you associate a vector field, uh, which is the push forward of multiplication by x along the flow as time uh, increases. And this is an operator that commutes with p, p being the linear operator that you see in here. I forgot to write it down. But p is i dt minus uh, uh, capital A of d. Uh, and so because this L commutes with your linear flow, uh, LU also will solve the linear equation, so the L2 norm is conserved. And then you can capture this t to the power minus one half decay um, using energy estimates. So the L infinity norm of the solution, uh, you gain this t to the power minus one half factor if you control your solution in L2 and LU in L2, and this requires controlling u at time 0 and LU at time 0. So this is um, sort of very easy to write down. This estimate um, may be a little bit difficult to prove uh, in general, but um, and, and also requires derivatives. I told you I have omitted all derivatives, uh, but this is uh, the general principle. And so now, if you want to get your global solution, you do some sort of bootstrap argument. You start with the decay that you want, which you set as a bootstrap assumption. And of course, there you put a large constant in front. And then you try to recover your bootstrap estimates in several steps. First, you do your energy estimates, so energy estimates for your solution u. Then the next step would be, like in the linear case, you would like to do energy estimates for this L operator applied to u, except that doesn't work. 
And so then uh, the fix to this is to replace your operator L that you had here on the previous slide by a nonlinear kind of normal form correction to it, um, which looks like your linear L plus a cubic perturbation. This cubic perturbation is, is nice, except that it has this T factor in front, which is large. And so uh, you would like to do instead uh, energy estimates for this uh, nonlinear variable. In many of these problems that we, we have looked at over the years, uh, this uh, nonlinear correction is suggested by scaling properties of the equation. So if your equation has some scaling symmetry, then uh, this uh, L nonlinear would be some sort of scaling derivative of your solution. But the interesting thing is that this applies, this, this kind of correction can be found even if you do not have a scaling symmetry. Um, and in this uh, expository notes, we, we show exactly how this is done. Uh, and uh, in, in essence, you have to solve some uh, cubic division problem uh, in the Fourier space. And so once you do this, you get some Gronwald's inequality for both u and l of u, uh, except that you don't get to have these quantities bounded you get instead for them to have some small power type pk. Um, and then um, you want to have some nonlinear vector field bound, uh, the t to the power minus one half. I wrote this a little bit more uh, weaker form than the one that you see in here. This is more precise. Um, one interesting catch in here is that on occasion, uh, it, it becomes interesting to look at this L nonlinear operator not as a perturbation of the linear operator, but instead to think of this inequality in here as a genuinely nonlinear inequality. And this is something that uh, we first explored also together with Mihaela in a paper that you wrote a couple of years ago on the Benjamin Ono uh, equation. All right, um, but even if you get this t to the power minus one half decay from this vector field bound, this combines with this slight growth, and so you're not there yet. And uh, so this takes us to the second bit in here, which is to look at the asymptotic profile and the asymptotic equation. So again, the objective is to close this bootstrap assumption for the L infinity norm of the solution. Uh, you have this ansatz that's inspired by the linear behavior, uh, the difference compared to the linear behavior is that in the linear behavior, this asymptotic profile gamma, you can take it to be as in, in, independent of time, whereas in the nonlinear problem, you expect this phenomena that's called modified scattering, where this gamma varies on a slow time scale um, uh, as, a, as a function of t. In essence, it satisfies an asymptotic equation. And so, um, if you uh, look at this asymptotic equation, the important thing is that you have this t to the power minus one factor. That's one important thing, which means that you can think of gamma as evolving on the log t scale rather than on the t scale. And the second important factor in here is that you have this coefficient, this q in here, and it's very important that this q is real because that guarantees that solutions to the actual ordinary differential equation here stay bounded as time goes to infinity, right? So the key point in here, uh, the, the key question in here, if you want, is how do you choose this uh, uh, asymptotic uh, uh, profile gamma given a solution u? Because a priori you start with the solution, you don't know what gamma is, you want to make a good choice for gamma and then show that your good choice for gamma solves the asymptotic equations. And um, uh, one second. Um, so on, on this slide, uh, you see uh, a quick historical discussion of uh, uh, how this uh, asymptotic equations developed uh, in the NLS con context. Um, and uh, there, there were a couple of ideas. So one uh, initiated by Hayashi and Naumkin and then refined by Kato and Pusateri is to look at uh, the Fourier transform of your solution U fix, time, fix uh, the frequency and look at the evolution of this as a function of t and try to show that you can think of this object in here as some sort of asymptotic profile. Uh, uh, Limblad and Sofer, on the other hand, said, well, maybe we're better off looking in the physical space. We look at derivative of the solution along rays um, and that also you can think of it as some sort of asymptotic profile. 
Um, finally, uh, Daifen Zhu uh, looked at completely integrable models and using, used the inverse scattering method for long range asymptotics. Um, uh, when we got interested in this kind of problems, we realized that both of these methods, A and B, have some disadvantages. So, in the first case, this is a perfect ansatz for the linear problem, but the nonlinearity in the equation gives you very large errors. Um, in the second case, uh, here you have very good behavior from the nonlinear point of view, but you have very large linear errors. So instead of either of these two methods, uh, we came up with uh, an idea that we call the wave packet testing method, where you produce your asymptotic profile by testing your um, uh, solution with what we call wave packets. And these are some solutions that are localized along an uh, array from starting from the origin. All right. Um, and the scale of localization here is the scale of t to the power one half. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into uh, a detailed discussion about wave packets, uh, but you'll have to take my word for it that this is the correct scale. And uh, um, so this uh, uh, testing with wave packets allows us to get uh, an asymptotic equation, like you see, uh, for instance, uh, on this slide here at the bottom. Um, and uh, the, the key idea is that testing with wave packets, you perfectly balance the size of the errors coming from the linear side of the equation with the errors coming from the nonlinear side of the equation. All right. Um, so um, I'll skip uh, a few things here to get to the second part, uh, uh, the second kind of results that we are uh, looking at. Um, and so here again, I wrote a typical uh, result. Um, so this time we're looking at the same problem, the same cubic nonlinear equation uh, in one dimension. But now we take small and non-localized initial data. So here for simplicity, I put the initial data in L2. All right. Um, and so I was telling you that in this case, one potential obstruction that appears is the existence of solitons. So you want to avoid solitons, or small solitons for the problem, which is why you add this assumption that your problem is defocusing. All right? And then the theorem tells us, well, then we're going to get a global solution for our problem. And this global solution is going to satisfy the L6 uh, streetcar estimates that I have emphasized in the beginning, and also is going to so satisfy this bilinear estimate. So here I made this bilinear estimates more precise. So I take my solution u, I project it to two different sets, a and b in frequency. So think of a and b as some frequency regions, some frequency intervals. All right, so if you want to do a very quick picture, um, this is a, this is b, this is the Fourier variable. You have some separation in here, all right? So the separation is so that we ensure that the A waves and the B waves at the linear level travel in different directions. And so then we have this bilinear estimate, which tells us that the L2 norm of the product of the A waves and the B waves is controlled by epsilon square, which is the expected factor. And then you have uh, a size in here, which depends on the distance between these two frequency sets, A and B. So this is a uh, work in progress with Mihaela, which we hope to uh, finish uh, shortly. We were planning to finish it before this conference, but um, uh, our teaching uh, got in the way. Um, all right. And um, so uh, one. To, to, so this is, uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, the, the first result really uh, of this type for non-localized initial data in one-dimensional flows. Um, and one comparison that you can make in here is uh, you can uh, look at what happens for, with this result if you take the classical uh, NLS problem, so cubic NLS, okay, minus Laplacian u is equal to u times u square. Hopefully I chose the correct sign in there to make it defocusing, uh, which I didn't, so change the sign. Um, 
All right, uh, so uh, this uh, theorem is new even for the NLS problem in the sense that, of course, for the NLS problem, we know that if the initial data is in L2, then we have a global solution, but these estimates are were not known uh, uh, until now. Uh, only some weaker bounds obtained by Planchon and Vega were known in this case. So I'll tell you a little bit about the way the, uh, we, we think about uh, our approach to this theorem. And one thing that you often do in uh, uh, dispersive equations, use little wood pellet decompositions to cut your function in frequency into dyadic pieces. Here, instead of cutting our function into dyadic pieces, we take a decomposition on the unit scale in frequency. So you have your, uh, again, your frequency set, and you chop this into unit intervals, all right? And, uh, J in there indexes this uh, unit intervals in here. Um, and so uh, you try to measure the different frequency localized portions of your solution U in terms of what are called frequency envelopes, an idea that came from um, Tau, but um, which we had to adapt quite a bit in here. So uh, one important property of this uh, frequency envelopes is that they are required to be slowly varying which means that when you go from j to j plus 1 or farther, they don't change very much. This is in order to account for nonlinear interactions in the problem. Uh, and this notion of slowly varying, we, have to, we had to adapt it quite a bit for uh, this uh, uh, unit scale frequency decomposition. Um, and then you want to do a bootstrap argument. And the bootstrap argument itself is a little bit complex because you don't just bootstrap the size of the solutions, you bootstrap three cards norms of these localized pieces. You also bootstrap the constants from the bilinear estimates. Uh, and here I forgot to put the Cj times Ck. Those should also be in there. Uh, this idea of bootstrapping both uh, strict cards and bilinear estimates. Uh, we had it earlier from, uh, again, a paper that we wrote on, on the Benjamin Ono equation. And so now you want to use this bootstrap arguments and improve the constants uh, in each of these estimates. So you put the large constant here, here, and here, and then you want to prove this uh, with better constants. Um, and so one key idea in here is to look at what are called uh, uh, localized density flux identities. So one classical thing that you do for nonlinear equations is you do energy estimates. But the better way to think of the energy estimates is uh, replacing an energy estimate with a density flux relation. And then your energy estimate is obtained by integrating your density flux relation. Here, we take this density flux relations, we also localize them in frequency. And so we have frequency localized density flux identities. So for instance, um, this uh, mj in here would be a localized mass uh, functional uh, associated to the j region uh, in our unit scale decomposition. If you just had the linear equation, then the time, time derivative of this localized mass is the x derivative of the localized momentum, and the uh, time derivative of the localized momentum is the x derivative of the localized energy. Uh, if you're looking at the nonlinear case with the cubic nonlinearity, you have to add some quartic terms in here. Now, quartic terms in here are not very good because uh, what we'll try to control in the end are L6 norms. So we're much happier with sixth order nonlinearities, uh, which we can control in terms of Strickard's estimates. So we go through this additional step of modifying this uh, not energies, but densities, but this is works like modified energies that I was telling you before. So the localized mass, we replace it by the sharp localized mass, uh, which is uh, your original localized mass plus um, a quartic correction, the same for the localized momentum. And then we improve our density flux identities by solving another more complex division problem so that our error term is of the order 6. We like order 6 in here, okay, because this is associated to the L6 Ricard's estimates. Um, and so once you have this density <coughs> flux identities, getting your energy bounds is easy by direct integration. But the key point is where do you get your Strickard's estimates from and where do you get this bilinear L2 estimates, all right? Uh, and the idea here is to use what are called the interaction Moravec bounds. These were introduced in a very different context 
by uh, the so-called uh, I-team uh, in the study of nonlinear Schrodinger equations. There is a version closer to this, but without the localization, that's due to um, Planchon and Vega. But here we take the additional step of number one, uh, working with this frequency localized uh, density flux identities, and number two, correcting the mass and the momentum functionals in order to uh, make them more accurate, all right? Uh, and so uh, using this uh, sharp uh, momentum and mass functionals, one defines uh, what, what is called an interaction Moravec functional, which is an integral in two variables, x and y, and this integral is restricted to the region where x is less than y. You compute the time derivative of this. This is a tricky computation. You have to be very careful because uh, you're not doing integration by parts here. All the objects that you're working with are multilinear forms, uh, which are translation invariant. They are described via their symbols in the Fourier space. Um, and still, you want to sort of simulate your integration by parts. All right. Um, and so uh, to make a long story short, when you take the time derivative of this uh, interaction, Moravec functional, you get the guys that you want, uh, the bilinear L2 estimate and the L6 bound. This L6 bound comes from the uh, defocusing assumption that I was telling you about before, plus lots of errors. Uh, and here I just wrote down the order of the errors. They get some sixth order errors, some eighth order errors, and some tenth order errors that you can estimate perturbatively somehow. Um, and this is where you get the L6 Strickhardt estimates in diagonal by linear L2. Diagonal means when you pair one frequency with the same frequency. So this works to get the L6 estimate, but doesn't completely solve the problem because you also want to look at bilinear L2 estimates for two unbalanced frequencies. So you want to put a J and K. So this is the interaction more of as functional for two different pieces of your solution. You write a formula that's very similar to the one in here. The philosophy behind this uh, interaction more of as functional is you want to look how mass is moving around and how momentum is moving around and uh, depending on the sign of A, um, one uh, of the mass or the momentum is moving faster to the right than uh, the other. Um, and so you take the time derivative of this uh, uh, transversal, uh, where's my pointer? Uh, it's gone. Uh, interaction Moravets. Um, and, and then you, you capture the last formula at the bottom, the bilinear L2 estimate for uh, two, two different frequencies. And then you have eventually to reassemble uh, everything together. So, uh, you know, this, this slide in here is about 20 pages of mathematics, but um, um, we're, one, one of the reasons we haven't finished writing the paper is because we're making an effort to, uh, to write this in a very clean way so that you can see a, a good uh, progression of, of ideas and uh, of, uh, of uh, computations. And I think I already went a little bit over time. So, uh, and now it's completely dead. Uh, I imagine that I went to the next slide. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. I'm sure there are comments, questions, or remarks. Yes, please. For the theorem with the localized the data, mm -hmm. if we choose uh, more uh, higher uh, localized uh, localization, for example, uh, exponential uh, localization, uh, we can expect more uh, decay on the solution? We do not expect more decay. Um, all that you can expect is maybe um, slightly better uh, tail estimate. But uh, the decay is the typical dispersive decay. You'd see this decay even if you did not have the nonlinearity, right? So even if you take uh, uh, the linear problem with localized uh, exponentially decaying data, you would still see this t to the power minus uh, uh, one half decay at infinity and no better. Okay. 
And uh, a second question, uh, if we consider, uh, for example, a two-dimensional uh, case, uh, the hypothesis uh, over the uh, second derivative of the symbol, uh, we can uh, choose, uh, for example, uh, a uh, the hypothesis of uh, definite uh, Hessian. Exactly. Look at the Hessian and you ask that uh, the Hessian is non-degenerate. And it is possible to relax uh, this hypothesis uh, with, uh, for example, a non uh, energetically non-degenerate condition? Uh, right. You can, uh, for instance, one, one of the examples that I wrote earlier was the KDV example, Xi cube, where the uh, dispersion is degenerate at frequency zero. So uh, th there, there is enough uh, analysis available at this point to handle this kind of degeneracy. Okay. Thank you. So more comments or questions? Um, maybe I have a question to the case for non-localized data. And in one of the last slides, uh, you mentioned that Littlewood Paley here, yeah, it's not the, one more, uh, it's not the right uh, thing to do, but you use your unit scale uh, decomposition. Could you explain that a little bit more in detail why why Littlewood Paley does not work, and, but your, your decomposition works? Thank you. That's, uh, that's a very good question. So what happens is, um, you see in here we have two kinds of estimates. We have the L6 estimates and the bilinear L2 estimates. Uh, and uh, so the L6 estimate is an estimate that essentially we prove it just for very localized uh, portions of the solution. We don't prove it globally at first. That uh, doesn't work. It doesn't work this way. Um, and so uh, the unit scale in frequency is the scale that allows us to get our hands on this L6 bound, all right? Um, and also the unit scale of frequency is the scale, the unit scale of frequency localization is the scale that allows us to interlace very well the L6 bounds with the uh, L2 bounds. So for instance, imagine that you want to prove a global L6 bound. Uh, so you'd be looking at some uh, integral uh, u to the power sec 6 dx, right? Uh, you can split this integral uj to the power 6 dx plus, and the rest of the contributions will be contributions which have at least one unbalanced interaction. And when you have the unbalanced interaction, you want to use this bilinear L2 bound for extra power. And the unit scale is exactly what allows these two pieces to match together well. Thank you. There would be time for one more question. Uh, no, it doesn't seem uh, the case. Then thank you again for a beautiful talk. Thank you.